So what I want to talk about today is, is what good is higher education? And I mean that deliberately in both senses of the term. What good is it? And what kind of a good is it? And what, if you just look in the papers recently, you'll see that there's a, a very significant number of proposed and actual cuts to higher education, uh, public higher education. Uh, this, of course, is not the first set. This has been going on now for more than a decade, more than two decades. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is, is as follows. I'm going to start by asking what the world is neoliberalism. I'm then going to talk about the consequences of it for administration, for education, for research, and for extension and outreach. I'm going to briefly talk about the crises that face not just American society, but the world. I'm going to try to at least open the question of what might be done with some proposals for change. And uh, as one tends to do with these kinds of things, I'm going to conclude. At least one, one would hope I'll get that far. Um, so let me begin by this question, what is neoliberalism? And I think the key thing, as, as Phil Morawski suggested, is neoliberalism is a thought collective. It, there is no specific doctrine that you can point to and say, that's neoliberalism. And I think one of the problems one has is a reification of this term. So you have, oh, well, that's due to neoliberalism. Well, maybe, maybe not. But I think the key issue here is that there's nobody enforcing a rule, uh, a specific set of texts, uh, a specific view of the subject. And there is a long history of considerable debate among people who we might call neoliberals, sometimes self-identifying, sometimes not, over what it is. However, at the same time, I think it's important to understand neoliberalism as a kind of social movement which has been extraordinarily effective in transforming the world over the last half century. I think we can say that that has been promoted by debates that started in the late 40s at the Mont Pelerin Society, uh, which was specifically set up to propose and to implement a particular set of policies, but that neoliberalism has, as it's been put into practice, been put into practice somewhat differently in different places and at different times. And I mean that not just within the US context, but on a global scale. So what you see happening in Britain, and I can tell you that, that in some ways the, the effect of neoliberalism in Britain on higher education are much more problematic than they are in the US, is yet different from what uh, is going on in the US. And of course, what's going on in the US is not the same on every single campus. There's considerable variation. So according, that said, despite this debate, I think we can say that it has been self-defined in a number of ways. First of all, in the transformation of all institutions into either markets or market-like competitions or just straightforward competitions. And at the same time, and this is, I think, critical to understanding, it's not just a matter of transforming the institutions, it's a matter of transferring people into competitive, entrepreneurial, risk-taking individuals for whom life is mainly a matter of winning in markets and competitions. So we're talking about a simultaneous transformation of the institutional structure in which we live and the nature of individual selves. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Neoliberals tend to argue that markets and competitions are the best way to organize all institutions, that they ensure the best outcomes, and importantly, neoliberals generally reject any notion of laissez-faire. That is to say, it's not just a matter of getting out of the way, it's a matter of getting nation states, getting governments to promote the production of markets and competitions everywhere. And you can see this in a whole series of laws that have been passed that transform various kinds of institutions that previously were hardly touched by markets into becoming much more market-like or changing things into competitions. So for example, uh, this institution, like every other university that I'm aware of in the United States, advertises that in such and such competition, we rank number two. 
in some other competition we rank number one, and so on, endlessly. At the same time, selves are reconstructed as entrepreneurial, as autonomous, as risk-taking. And one can see this, if one wants to look philosophically, you can see this as kind of an enactment of Hobbes's view of the world. That is to say, an enactment of the idea that we are all autonomous individuals and that we need some sort of social contract in order to hold us together. And once we get that in place, uh, we will be able to produce uh, a prosperous, satisfactory society. Individual choice is promoted in consumption. We're all talk, talked about, we talk constantly about the promotion of choice and how wonderful choice is. But at the same time, it's accompanied by a new kind of Taylorism. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, Frederick Winslow Taylor, turn of the century, turn of the last century engineer, uh, who coined the term scientific management and developed an, an entire industry of people engaged in time and emotion studies, uh, the idea being to find the best way, according to Taylor, uh, the most efficient way uh, to perform all kinds of manual labor. And indeed, most assembly line processes, starting with Henry Ford's assembly lines at the beginning of the century, most assembly line processes followed and still follow very much along Taylorist lines. Five or 30 years is that aided by information technologies, this notion has been extended to nearly all occupations through the constant auditing of everyone. It's become possible to create this kind of new form of Taylorism. Now the justification for this is that since we are all autonomous individuals, each out for ourselves, production has to be monitored constantly in order to ensure that we don't cheat, right? Because otherwise, there's this tendency to goof off and let somebody else carry the burden. We're all autonomous individuals. We all want to do the engage in the least effort necessary. So the solution to that problem is to audit us constantly. Neoliberals, hence, have managed to recast universities over the last several decades. And they've done this in at least four domains. I won't repeat them out loud. You see them there up on the screen. Uh, and let me talk then briefly about each of these. First of all, I'm going to start with administration. And I want to start with a footnote here, an important footnote. My intent here is not to lay the blame at the feet of administrators. My, the point here is to point out how administrators, in some cases not even knowingly, have been forced into new kinds of roles that require that they do things that we didn't demand of administrators in the past and to abandon some of the things we did demand of, of administrators in the past. So we've seen not only changing roles of administrators, but a massive explosion in the number of administrators. And this is partially because of one of the paradoxes. People who are advocates of markets claim that markets are so much more efficient than bureaucracies. People who are advocates of competitions claim this will produce the best results. But the catch is, the closer you come to the perfect market, the bigger the bureaucracy you must have. This is not, these are not opposites, these are complements. You must have a bureaucracy if we're going to, think about, think about the National Football League. If you want to have football, you have got to have a very elaborate bureaucracy to make sure that everybody adheres to the rules. And even with that, as we well know, people will manage to come up with all sorts of interesting ways to cheat. So we've also seen that the number of administrators has grown at a rate roughly 10 times faster than the numbers of tenured faculty. Why is this the case? Well, first of all, it's new unfunded mandates based on notions of audit of one sort or another. So crime reports, uh, listing online of the books that are ordered for each course, uh, specifying the, grad the salaries of graduates of various programs uh, when they get out, uh, sexual harassment policies, and so on endlessly. Now, it's not to say that any of these are necessarily bad. 
It's simply the, the volume of it and the way in which it's introduced promotes bureaucratic gloat, a bloat. We've also seen the adoption, adoption of what is known as new public management. And uh, as a couple of German colleagues point out, it's a combination of free market rhetoric and intensive management control practices. New, new public management, knowingly or unknowingly, involves the use of audits to control actions, and it uses the states as well as federal governments to have increased the mandates for universities, while the reliability, the cost of collecting, and of analyzing those data are almost never discussed. So we wind up in a situation in which, well, of course, we want to make sure people are doing their jobs, but nobody's asking the tough question, which is, A, are the measures we're collecting actually telling us that? And B, if they are telling us that, what's it costing us to collect that information? After all, one could monitor my activities 24 hours a day both physiologically as well as socially by having a room full of cameras and all sorts of elaborate measuring equipment and then we could have a whole staff of people who would analyze that stuff over time. Far more people would require to do that than would require me in, in the room to, to, to be monitored. We've also seen the creation of more and more administrative careers. That is to say Administrators in universities have moved from a role of being largely the protectors of faculty, that is to say, our job is to keep all of the, the people who otherwise would be on top of you every day, to keep them away so that you can actually engage in your activities, to becoming managers of faculty. And we've seen a vast increase in the growth of salaries among top administrators, excuse me, as some of you probably know, the presidents of Ohio State and Texas A&M universities now have total compensation somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of $2 million per year, which I suspect is substantially more than the salary of most of these people in the room here. Universities, of course, have also seen uh, the growth of marketing offices. Uh, as you wander around the campus here, you will see these huge signs that say Spartans will. I'm not sure what Spartans will do other than pay for a lot of signs, but in any case, the point is that this is clearly part of this kind of marketing effort. Um, we have data from various ranking organizations uh, that are usually promoted, although the quality of those data are often disputed. And at the same time, of course, we have a growth in the number of low-paid adjunct faculty. These folks are generally not only poorly paid, but have insecure jobs, and they make up a growing percentage of our total faculty. We've seen changes, of course, in funding for universities. A decline in state funds, accompanied, not surprisingly, by a rise in tuition, rise in public and private grant getting, uh, and a rise in the quest for donations. Of course, at the same time as we've seen state funding decline, we've seen a lot of politicians complaining about rising tuition. Uh, it, which is somehow, somehow the connection between these things doesn't seem to, to connect with those politicians. We've also seen running of universities more and more by the numbers. Lots and lots of quantitative data. Every large university, certainly this one included, has some sort of office that collects and massages vast quantities of quantitative data. The catch is that almost all of these numbers come from convenience samples. That is to say, these are data that are easy to collect. They're not data that are collected the way you would collect data, say, for a scientific experiment. Um, if I was a, a biologist here on campus doing uh, genomics research, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, look, look there's this some broccoli over there. I guess I can, I can look at the DNA of that. And, oh, over here, there's some turnips. No, I would have a very clear set of protocols. I wouldn't just randomly collect the data uh, because it was convenient. Um, also, I should note that while this move towards more and more quantitative data suggests concreteness, it obscures the fact that there is nothing more abstract than numbers. Numbers are the most abstract thing we have in our contemporary world. And of course, what we want in universities is quality. 
but is extremely hard to quantify. It's easy to count publications. It's much more difficult to measure their import. The other problem here are the issues with these universities by numbers. First of all, the very collection of metrics of human activity change behavior. This fellow Goodhart said it very nicely. He says, when a measure becomes a target, it's no longer a reliable measure. So if you're told, we're going to measure your performance based on the number of articles you produced, based on the number of students you taught, whatever, whatever the measure might be, once you start to do that, it loses its value as a measure. In addition, we have a problem of errors. That, as I mentioned earlier, the data analyzed in this manner is never the result of scientific lab work or scholarly analysis, but what's conveniently available. And anybody who has been in any administrative position and looked at the data collected about their unit can point to errors. Oh, wait a minute. This grant over here that we got somehow didn't get into the, into the database. Or this person over here who's been assigned this actually isn't doing that. Happens all the time. And of course, measures are never a substitute for judgment. So let me shift away from the administration to the education side. As all of you know, we've seen student debt climb to where it now totals over a trillion dollars, more than all consumer debt put together. We also know that we have many students working 30 to 40 hours a week in order to keep the debt load down. And not surprisingly, the combination of debt and the need to minimize it has had its effect on students' performance. We can see that in terms of the amount of time students have the amount of time they can devote to courses, the kind of frenetic lives that many of them live. And of course, all of this involves a move from public support to individual support for higher education. We've also seen, of course, a rise in for-profit competition for higher education. And I think it's very important to emphasize here that this is a completely false kind of for-profit of for profit enterprise. It's false in the sense that these institutions can only exist by virtue of their being heavily dependent on government grants. Moreover, they have a poor record of recruiting and placement, um, and hence do a miserable job of substituting for public higher education, or even for that matter, private higher education in nonprofit institutions. We've seen a decline of support for such things as foreign language instruction. Uh, curiously, at the very moment in which we are moving towards a, uh, probably more interchange with the rest of the world than at any time in previous history, uh, we have dropped foreign language requirements, and our students are much more likely to misunderstand those who come from other culture, and less likely to understand how languages create the worlds in which we live. Um, we've seen uh, states like Tennessee, for example, uh, which curiously now mandates that the first year salaries of graduates be posted online. Um, and uh, of course, what this completely uh, covers over is the fact that one's first year salary doesn't say very much about your career trajectory. On top of that, they can only collect those data on students who stay in Tennessee. The others just fade off into oblivion. Um, and. Education is, uh, we've also seen, of course, a decline of support for the arts, for social sciences and humanities, uh, and we've seen education as being redefined as mainly uh, salary maximization. Uh, one of the more interesting and disturbing aspects of this, which has run off my screen here, is, uh, is what Texas A&M is up to, uh, and that is uh, they've actually calculated uh, down to the penny, how much you as a faculty member contribute to the overall income of the institution. In other words, how many students have you been involved with, how many grants have you collected, uh, how many this, that, and the other thing have you done, and they've actually produced a publicly available ranking of every member of the faculty in terms of just exactly uh, where they fit uh, in terms of their monetary contributions to the institution. We've also, of course, seen a growth in standardized testing. Um, and this pressure, the pressure for national standardized testing 
uh, for university students is growing, uh, much like we are already requiring for elementary and secondary students. Uh, doing so, of course, would dramatically reduce the creativity of the university curriculum, as it has done for elementary and secondary education. Uh, we've seen a, uh, a dumbing down of higher education. Uh, data that have been collected suggest students now spend about half as much time studying as they did in the 1960s. Uh, that 32 um, uh, percent, uh, that, um, I'm sorry, uh, 32 percent of students uh, now take uh, um, no single course that requires more than 40 pages per week of reading, uh, and half uh, take courses that don't require even 20 pages a week of reading. Um, I certainly can say from my own experience that I've come across graduate students uh, who have difficulty in writing straight sentences. Uh, a non-trivial issue. And of course we've seen uh, a major rise in plagiarism as pr university degrees become more and more credentials rather than actual substance. Um, one of the things we've also seen happening is actually institutionalized plagiarism. This is the home page of one of these organizations uh, called Lash Zone that promotes institutionalized plagiarism. And this is a quote right off their page. We offer professional assistance. Note the, the deli probably deliberate grammatical mistakes. We offer professional assistance on assignments, essays, lab reports, assignment revision. You get the idea. We already got have the degrees you are trying to get. And we'll proudly assist you in getting one too, whether it's math, chemistry, so on and so forth. This is one of many of these. So in other words, this is not just simply a matter of saying, I'm going to copy something that was produced. You can now buy papers that are produced to order for a particular class. Why bother to study when somebody can do this for a relatively nominal fee? And I should note, by the way, most of these are located, physically located, uh, in places that are essentially uh, untouchable. Uh, so we find a lot of them uh, based in Eastern Europe, uh, based in, in the Middle East, in, in a variety of places where there's really no way that you can put a stop to them. Um, let me move to research. Um, it wasn't that long ago we started publication counting. And of course, the nice thing about counting publications, it doesn't require very much work. It's easy to count them. However, in some fields, it's really easy to divide research into ever smaller pieces. So, uh, and there's, by the way, some very interesting studies that have been done that show uh, even in fields where you wouldn't expect this, like medieval history, it becomes easier to write a lot of short papers about the same subject rather than to write that significant volume that talks about it. Um, we've seen a growth in the number of journals, huge growth in the number of journals, such that it's likely that you can find a home for virtually any paper you want to imagine. In fact, if you have a few hundred bucks, you can pretty much guarantee it'll be published somewhere. But of course, we can also rank the journals and see whether someone publishes in highly ranked journals. Um, and that turns out to be a problem because, of course, one has to ask them, well, on what basis are you ranking the journals? And usually they're being ranked based on how many times people cite them. So we move to citations. Let's count citations. The, the, get, the advantage here, of course, is that I, as an author, can't control who cites my work for the most part. I could self-cite a little bit, but obviously that's not going to have much effect on the total. The catch, of course, is if you're working in a small field, you're far less likely to be cited than if you're working in a large field. You, you simply, if I've got 10 colleagues who are working in the area I work in, and I'm cited by all 10, wow, I got 10 citations. But if I'm working in a field in which there are 5,000 scientists working in that same field, uh, the likelihood of my getting 10 citations is much higher. Uh, moreover, we can be cited for reasons that are utterly unrelated to high quality research. And my favorite example here is this fellow, uh, Huang Wu Suk, uh, who you may remember some years ago, several years ago now, was. Uh, found to have published several, two fraudulent papers in science uh, on stem cell, stem cell research. He's been cited 388 times. Uh, however, of course, almost all of those citations were citations pointing how his data were fraudulent. 
Um, so you want to get good citations, publish something fraudulent, and you will get cited. Um, moreover, citations, I want to emphasize, are, are about articles rhetoric, not quality. Different citation measures lead to different results. Co-authoring is a problem. Should we encourage people to co-author? We're talking about the push for more interdisciplinary research. Ah, but if you're going to have interdisciplinary research, you're going to have a lot of co-authors. But if you're going to have a lot of co-author, well, how can we evaluate you as an autonomous individual? One scientometrician sums it up nicely. He says, there's a better way to evaluate the importance of a paper or research output of a scholar. Read it. But of course, that would require additional work. Um, Checking journal prestige is really quite interesting. Uh, I just recently received a, a pro forma from the University of Cardiff to evaluate a faculty member for promotion. And apparently faculty members are required for every paper they've published to list on their CV the ranking of the journal in some ranking system. It actually doesn't even tell you on the thing what ranking system they used. And a good example here of the problem with this is the story of Akerlof. Akerlof is a well-known, he's the, the husband of the current head of the Federal Reserve. He has a Nobel Prize in, in economics uh, based on a very interesting paper he wrote called The Market for Lemons. And the paper was originally submitted to the American Economic Review, the top journal in economics. And it was rejected because the reviewers said, ah, you know, this is interesting, but these kinds of things will never happen. This is so obscure and irrelevant, and it was rejected. And it wound up being published in a second or third tier journal, the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Okay. And that's what got him the Nobel Prize. Well, why didn't it get into the top journal? Well, it didn't get into the top journal because, of course, the top journals are the ones where the, shall we say, the norms of scholarship, the norms of what constitutes a good article are going to be the most narrowly conceived. These are the people who are most committed to the orthodoxy in their field. Moreover, of course, all of this downs, downgrades the publication of books, publication of book chapters, and it promotes a greater incidence of fraud. Uh, one study estimates a tenfold increase in retractions due to fraud since 1975. That's actually published retractions. And the other, of course, uh, the, the fraud is promoted by this desire to do well in the endless performance audits. We've also seen the rise of two very interesting and disturbing phenomena. Ghost authorship, which is where the author's name doesn't appear on the article anywhere. And honorary authorship, where the name on the paper is actually not that of the author. The two obviously go together. Uh, in fact, a study of, study of the top six medical journals 21% of the papers had either honorary or ghost authors or both. In other words, 21 of them would take somebody, oh, well, you know, Rubain, he's very well known in uh, some particular field, so we're going to ask him to put his name on this paper, even though he had absolutely nothing to do with it. And so-and-so over there, well, you know, uh, you write very well, so we'll give you the job of writing the paper, we'll pay you to do that, but don't expect that your name is going to be on it anywhere. Well, of course, we can also get into grant competition. And here, the proponents for competitions, grant competitions argue that, well, this is, ensures that the most promising research from the most promising researchers get funded. It funnels research to the important topics, and it's the most efficient way to distribute research funds. On the other hand, the critics argue that competitive grants are very costly. They have very short duration. Three years is a long time for a competitive grant. It's hard to get anything longer than that. They tend to support the Matthew effect, which is basically that whoever has produced a lot of grants in the past is more likely to get them in the future. And people who are new to the grant process have one heck of a hard time getting hold of those grants. We also know, because of declining amounts of grant money, the success rates are declining. So if you figure that the, the, the success rates for many grants now are under 20%, that means that five, at least one-fifth of, uh, only one-fifth of the people who might write those grants are actually being published. All the rest of the time, that those are the people engaged in grant writing has, is basically down the drain. 
There's also some evidence, and admittedly it's limited, that block grants are actually more effective in getting research done. Conflicts of interest have arisen as a result of this. Uh, in the past, universities were very reluctant to accept private funds. Today, university faculty are urged to collaborate with the private sector. And in some cases, the plant biology department at the University of California, Berkeley, is a great example. And the entire department, for a period of five years, uh, with the exception, I think, of two faculty members, was being funded by the Novartis Corporation. Not surprisingly, all other companies uh, wanted nothing whatever to do with that department during that period of time, for obvious reasons. Uh, and at the same time, an awful lot of the research they, were, they, they did uh, couldn't be discussed outside of the department. In addition, in some disciplines, there are a few scholars who are not receiving industry support. Food science is an example of one of those. It's very hard to find anybody in food science who doesn't have support from a food company. Which means if you want disinterested opinions on the subject, you're going to have a heck of a time finding a food scientist who can provide that disinterested opinion. Now, in addition to that, I would argue that the constant auditing promotes the churning out of papers and that innovative and high risk research threatens the flow of that, those papers. Why take a chance on something which is innovative or high risk and, vince, and hence may fail when uh, indeed that uh, would reduce that flow? Negative results, of course, are not only rarely published, there's evidence that they're now more rarely published than they used to be in the past. And at the same time, we've seen a heightening, I think that's the right term to use, a tightening or heightening of intellectual property rights. In the past, there was a sort of general agreement that most of the research done at universities uh, would be open to the public. We see more and more of that taken into the proprietary sectors. And what that has meant at the same time is that there's a tremendous amount of, of proprietary inventions about which it's impossible to actually do research. So about two years ago, some entomologists and pathologists had found it so difficult to evaluate, evaluate the environmental consequences of genetically modified crops that they complained to the Environmental Protection Agency. They, as far as I know, this problem still remains. It has never been fully resolved, although some movement was done with the American Seed Trade Association. Um, in addition, we've seen the rise of these intellectual property offices on universities. Initially, the idea was that these weren't designed as money makers. These were going to be means to get research faster out to universities and to avoid off orphan research products. But in fact, universities have seen them as cash cows. And uh, not that they've been very successful. If you look overall, there are far more uh, of these research um, uh, intellectual property offices that have actually uh, have, have negative balances than there are with have positive balances and only about a half, handful of institutions actually have significant uh, inflow of funds. Uh, this university did for a while based on a single pro patent. That patent since expired and I don't know what the current numbers are, but I know that they're way, way down from where they were. Well, the consequence of this publication obsession is education and research has been downgraded uh, relative, I'm sorry, education and outreach have been downgraded relative to research. Non-publication activities have also been downplayed. So why spend time advising students or attending seminars or organizing professional meetings, reviewing papers and grant applications, or any kind of informal faculty interactions when in fact uh, you're not rewarded for that stuff? You're rewarded for churning out papers uh, and uh, making sure that those papers somehow get widely cited. And research, of course, in the sciences particularly, are more and more dominated by immediate economic ends. See if you can do that bit of research that's going to get you a patent, which is going to be uh, where somebody's going to pay big bucks for. This, of course, means also a decline in public interest in science. Um, research in the past in universities tended to focus on, on pra uh, practices and provided products the results, I'm sorry, uh, freely. But when material objects are produced, uh, as they were in that case, uh, such as, for example, seeds and vaccines, these things were shared. So if you take 
uh, Salk's work on polio. The vaccine was nobody ever patented the vaccine on polio. It was simply given away. Um, if we look at agricultural experiment stations, such as the one here, when they produced new seed varieties, uh, they were simply given away. Um, but that's, of course, those kinds of things have few market benefits, and so they are disappearing. Two examples which are particularly important is the decline in research on biological control and the decline of research on apomixis. Apomixis is the replacement of sexual uh, by asexual reproduction in plants. Uh, and what that means is the producing of, of a variety which is identical to its parent uh, without having to uh, have a hybrid. In other words, it's, it's a way in which the, the seed that you, you get from the plant will breed true. So if, if I had a hybrid, uh, I'm sorry, uh, hybrid corn and I plant the seeds, I get something which is utterly useless. I have to go out and buy seeds again. But if I have a, an apomic, uh, and I plant that, the seeds I get will be plantable and produce the same kind of crop the following year. You can see how the folks in the market side wouldn't be pre appreciative. Moving on to extension, we see a decline in support for extension and outreach. Uh, we see outreach as a form of free, free comp, as a, an area where free competition, in quote, um, uh, sorry, let me start again. We see outreach as free whereas competition in the market could prevail. And outreach then is redefined in terms of things like startup businesses generated by university-based research, often financed by public funds. Um, and uh, we see this happening despite the fact that the number of successful startups is small, and most of those successful ones are bought by large corporations, which basically means uh, all of this is a, is a nice way of subsidizing uh, those particular firms. Um, we've seen a growth of private extension-like services. Uh, here again, to neoliberals, extension interferes in what otherwise would be a flourishing market for farm services. Uh, these services are growing, of course, as extension declines. Obviously, those who can't afford to pay are excluded from them. And it changes the nature of the service provided, focusing heavily on product purchases. So for example, private extension services are much more likely to try to sell you a fertilizer, a seed, a pesticide than public extension services. The gap between research and outreach, much of the research that's taking place on college campuses today can't be used directly by final users. Uh, it has to go through some other organization, usually a private company of some sort. And the university is more and more seen as a kind of growth machine. The idea here is that we're going to, here in universities, we're going to bring vast amounts of economic development. Educating citizens, providing a liberal education, these are things that are, if not no longer valued, certainly valued far less than they were in the past. Well, none of this would be of any great importance were it not for the fact that we're facing a series of major, major crises. And I list a few of them here. I don't have the time this morning to go into them, but you've all, you all know what these are. Um, these are crises that aren't going to go away. They're not going to be solved tomorrow morning. Uh, and I would argue that the, uh, the, ra the radical changes that are taking place and have taken place in higher education push us away from being able to grapple with these crises. These are wicked problems that cannot be solved, resolved through puzzle solving. Each of them requires changes in technologies, in laws, in standards, and in norms. And grappling with these problems is going to be a necessity for us as well as for future generations. So there are two major questions facing higher education. What kinds of selves do we want to produce? And what kind of university should public universities be? These questions have been asked, this question of, of institutions has been asked thousands of times, probably more. And it requires a double answer. That is to say, we have to provide answers about what kind of institutions to construct. But the moment we do that, it implies also asking what kind of faculty, what kind of students, what kind of staff, what kind of stakeholders should we have? 
But to ask what kind of cells we want on the surface seems to be an absolutely outrageous question, a kind of so social engineering of sorts. And some might say, well, shouldn't people be free to decide what they want to be without interference uh, from institutions of higher education or someone else? <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is precisely the point. There is no way to produce selves completely free of the influence of others and of institutions. This is an absurd myth. Selves are fundamentally social. We learn who we are by virtue of the society within which we are born, born. The parents, the friends, the schooling, all of those folks who influence our childhood socialization. And that's the case because we're neither fully autonomous like neoliberals want us to be, nor are we fully socialized. In fact, during the heyday of state socialism, much effort was given to molding selves who would support the state. Stakhanovite notions in the Soviet Union uh, were a wonderful example of that. You were demonstrating through your work that you were supporting the state. Well, what we've seen since the Cold War is an effort to mold selves as autonomous market-oriented actors ideal participants in a market society. This, I suggest, is precisely the mirror image of the state socialism we found in the Soviet Union. To achieve liberty, you cannot force everyone into a predetermined mold. It simply cannot be done. Or I should say, if, if you want liberty, it cannot be done. So what kind of cells do we want? Well, it suggests, I would argue, that liberty and freedom require people to first become reflexively aware of how others limit their own self-formation. It requires the ability to decide within the limits of social life what kinds of selves we want to have. And it requires having the wherewithal to change ourselves over the course of our life course. Each of these aims, I would argue, is appropriately pursued in the context of the university. So where do we go from here? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognize the new Taylorism. And we need to recognize that what's happening in higher education is in no way whatever limited to higher education. If you talk to people involved in policing, in social work, in elementary and secondary education, in health and medicine and in nearly all large businesses, they will tell you, gee, what you're telling me sounds very similar to what's happening to me. Um, it's fascinating. I've been at a couple of meetings where some top managers in, in some large corporations were present, and they were all talking about the wonders of dashboards. These are these collections of massive amounts of statistical data upon which you, the claim is you can manage your company. To a certain extent, there's a truth to that, but it's, it's far more limited than some people would want to admit. The point, in any case, is that this kind of constant auditing, this kind, kind of promotion of a particular kind of self is not something happening just in the higher education sector. It's happening across the board. But as Rebain suggested in, in doing the introduction this morning, we are one of the few places where it's possible not, not guaranteed that it will work, but it's possible to resist this kind of thing. In most of these other spheres, that resistance is much more difficult. So we need to publicize the consequences of turning everything into markets and competitions. We need to emphasize that this means building ever larger bureaucracies. It means devaluing all the other values by subordinating them to those of the market and competition. It means undermining democratic governance and replacing it with autocracy. And it means creating widespread insecurity. Instead, is to provide security for those who inhabit universities. We've moved from a place where the university education and research could be pursued in security to one in which insecurity is promoted through incessant audits, through fewer people protected against summary dismissal, and through high student debts. We can no longer afford to manufacture such insecurity. 
We also need to build learning communities. We need to get rid of the older notion that we, the faculty, have all the answers and our job is to stand up there and impart them to the rest of the world. We need to build these learning communities in which we all simultaneously learn. We probably need to reform or abolish the credit hour, which has become a sort of meaningless notion in the sense that all courses are three credit hours. Um, we need to eliminate or at least drastically reduce the span of standardized testing and to restrict the use of classroom lectures. We need to use the information technologies not to eliminate universities, but to tear down the walls between classrooms and the world. We now have the luxury of a vast amount of material that's out on the web, and we can use information technologies to invert and vastly improve the usual lecture discussion format. We can ask students to listen to online lectures or read texts or listen to a podcast and come to class and discuss it. We can make more of education into group activities. Nearly all work situations require group activities. But we still teach as if learning were entirely individualized. And of course, we can better integrate research and education than we currently do. We can also recognize the importance of slow scholarship. And let me explain here. Uh, you can look this up on the web. A German group recently proposed the need for slow science. And they note that t doing science, doing it well, requires time to read, to discuss, and to fail. They also note that science doesn't always know where it's going. And I would argue the same can be said about all scholarship. We need to reward research based on substance, not numbers. We need to make universities into models of democracy, deliberation, and discourse rather than more and more into autocratic and bureaucratic organizations. We need to get rid of the idea that research is some sort of a race. It has to be rewarded on substance rather than how it fits various metrics. In fact, those metrics destroy the communities that universities are. And we need to help to produce sustainable societies. We need to assess assessments. Fine, you want an assessment? Let's assess the consequences of that assessment. Let's assess whether the measurements actually measure what they claim to measure. And we need, of course, to bring the arts and humanities back in. Because turning out people who are merely technocrats in whatever field leads us down a very slippery slope away from democratic governance. We also need to challenge the prevailing wisdom that higher education is just about getting a better paying job. And I should note that we can't do that until we get rid of this massive student debt. We need to ensure that students are exposed to a variety of images of the future. The future involves more than just getting a high paying job. And we need to demand that the auditors be audited, the assessments be assessed. So, to conclude, what good is higher education? Well, it's, is it that which is necessary to produce educated citizens who can participate in a democratic society? Top quality research that will enrich our lives? New knowledge for the community through outreach and extension? Or is it to churn out credentials needed to get high paid jobs? and research that has immediate market value. I leave you with that question. Thank you very much. For questions, so if anyone uh, uh, has a question, please go ahead and uh, pose it. Did you want to? No, no, you, you. Let's start in the back. So you played out a radical agenda of what we need to do. My question is how we do it, because as the next generation of scholars and faculty coming into the institution, we're told to be quiet, to stay quiet. We see a system of professors stay quiet for late tenure, we see tenure faculty stay quiet for the late tenure. And so what can all of you who are emeritus faculty or you know, senior leadership or administrators now at the institutions do to help us try to leverage and make this change? Well, obviously, I don't have a nice set of neat answers, but let me suggest first thing is necessary is promoting awareness of the interconnectedness of all this stuff. 
okay, that the vast majority of our colleagues on university campuses grouse about the current situation, but they often do not understand how they connect. So first is convincing people, demonstrating the, the interconnectedness of these issues and how this is not going to get, this is not a temporary phenomenon. This is a phenomenon that's going to get worse if it's not stopped. Secondly, I would argue we need to start to think about how to build connections with these other professions that are under similar constraints. And to be honest, I'm not sure how you go about that except by starting to do it. I think it's, it's one of those things, you, it's sort of like swimming. You learn it by doing it. You don't learn it by writing a book about it. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good answer, but it's about the best I can do. Yeah? I just want to add something to the answer. Can I? Uh, no, it's not on. I'll use this because I'm OK, all right. I said I wanted to add something to the answer. Um, I work at York University in Toronto, and uh, some of you may or may not know that both York University and U of T right now have two uh, raging TA strikes um, that have been going on for months. Um, and it, uh, speaking just of York right now, because that's where I am, um, the administration initially uh, closed down classes. That's what they had done in the previous TA strike. It made things a lot more orderly for students. I don't know what their motivations were, but it certainly made uh, the experience more orderly for students because they knew there were no classes, so it wasn't a matter of which classes are on, which classes aren't, and so on. But uh, two weeks ago, our administration decided to resume classes. Um, and a number of our departments, um, mine included, um, of members, individual members felt uh, we can't go back to class, we can't cross our own TA's picket lines. Besides that, there are issues here, student debt being one of them, job insecurity another, that we all are concerned about, so we have to help these uh, young people take a stand. Um, now, there were people, like you're mentioning, uh, colleagues that came into the university at an earlier stage or a later stage than I did. Um, I'm very used to a, a, a whole 30 years of activism um, and being on strike and doing various things. Um, not subject to this kind of neoliberal um, subjectivity that we've been experiencing for the last 20 years or so, at least. Anyway, um, those colleagues wanted to take a stand, but they were, as you say, kind of cowed, concerned about punishment, they were not tenured, what would it do to their careers, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what happened is that we collectively, departments, with other departments, uh, announced that our classes would not resume um, and have not participated in any way at sort of giving individual reports in as to what we're doing. Uh, just doing that collectively, and that has given people a real sense of support for doing what they want to do. And I think that more and more experiences like that, because I think the academic uh, life is very much into individuating us, sometimes for good reason, but certainly under current regimes, not so. And anything that we can do that actually allows us to combine together at the lowest level you don't have to always think just to the big level, the lowest level of our own in departmental, uh, uh, departmental relationships around issues that uh, touch on the topics that have been raised, I think really helps to give support. People have to feel that they don't have to do the struggle on their own, and they can be a part of another group. Um, people who maybe along with some senior people know a path to go um, that have done it before or not, because uh, the young people coming in now are, are both cows, but they're also angry. Um, and you can tap into that angry pretty easily. Thank you. One more, one more question, please. Uh, we had the pleasure to talk about units last night, and I wanted to see if you could maybe um, uh, expound further on that. Um, in, in my own university, for example, uh, departments were collapsed into units, and it was largely a, a managerial piece, but there was also a curricular piece to it, which was that we entertained having cross-disciplinary conversations and, and uh, 
problem with faculty, I think, uh, as a faculty member, but also as an administrator, is missing those opportunities to take ownership over what they still have, which is the curriculum. So I wanted to see if you had anything else to say about this movement toward you making units of otherwise shared governance locations well, in the university. Having, having not personally experienced it, I, I have some difficulty. I mean, I've seen it from a distance. Um, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that the current structure of departments is ideal. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure that rearranging everything into these kind of units accomplishes what it's claimed what is claimed to be accomplished. Um, I think most institutions, and I'll use this one, which I know best, as an example. Uh, most institutions are well aware that interdisciplinary research is the way to go. Uh, that, at the same time, however, um, they've developed reward systems that actually discourage that. Uh, because let's face it, the moment you get involved in, in an interdisciplinary activity, the first thing you have to do is to spend an awful lot of time getting to know your colleagues, uh, figuring out how you can do things together, developing common language, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's this constant tension between how fast can I get that stuff churned out and, uh, and how can I do interdisciplinary research. And, and I would argue that, again, I mean, I think the point that was just made a moment ago, uh, uh, forms of organization are, are needed here. One of the things that I think is a, is a potential point of entree, anyway, is, is that traditionally in American universities, we've assumed that the questions about scholarship are a function of scholars. And questions about administration are a question for administrators. And what we've seen is a major encroachment of administration into virtually everything. Okay. And the claim is, oh, this doesn't in any way affect your scholarship. This doesn't in any way affect those curricular decisions. Well, of course, in fact, it does. And I think that means sort of reconstructing faculty governance in one way or another. But it certainly involves making a lot more of a stink than the stink we've been making to date. Stay right there if you would, please. Sure. We can both fit up here, I hope. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. I have a, uh, a plaque I want to uh, present to Larry. It states, uh, Julian Samara Research Institute presented to Lawrence Bush, keynote speaker, Neoliberalism in Public Higher Education Conference, reified now forever. Uh, March 27th, 28th, 2015, East Lansing, Michigan. Thank you very much. I was Thank you. Thank you. Please feel free to uh, visit with our speakers as we make our way down to the uh, other side of the building. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh. <laughs> Has that made a